There is a 575 square mile expanse of heavily guarded land and restricted airspace that pilots call Dreamland. But most people refer to it as Area 51, the designation it received from the Atomic Energy Commission in 1958. 42-year-old German-born Jörg Arnu maintains a website dedicated to exploring this mysterious region and makes regular scouting trips to its closely guarded perimeter. This is the famous uh, border of Area 51 right here. We see the warning signs on both sides of the road here. Up on the hill behind me, there's a security vehicle with two security guards with binoculars and probably all kinds of other equipment watching us right now. Since the late 1950s, numerous unidentified flying objects have been spotted in the skies above Area 51. See, see that's, that's a ship. The locals are used to hearing reports about such unexplained phenomena. We saw a craft in the sky and we stopped our vehicle and watched it do maneuvers. It was doing zigzags, right, left, up. Oh, it was, it was pretty crazy. Whatever is happening within Area 51, the government is committed to keeping it secret. They're authorized to shoot you. If they did, there isn't a law enforcement agency in the world that could go retrieve your body if you were in Area 51. You have no access to get in there. The propulsion system is really an amazing But in 1989, a 30-year-old resident of Las Vegas named Bob Lazar claims to have pierced the veil of secrecy surrounding these flights. If they were United States craft, we wouldn't be going backward trying to find out how they were built if we had built them. Uh, second of all, His story leads thousands of people to believe that something otherworldly is happening in the Nevada desert. When Bob Lazar emerged in public with his claims to have worked on reverse engineered flying saucers, it began to draw UFO fans from around the world. Oh, yeah. It's floating. Yeah, it does. It looks like it's floating, but it's changing shape. And his legend became critical to the whole emerging folklore of Area 51. To this day, Lazar stands by his story. I am convinced this was an extraterrestrial craft. I verified how the equipment in it worked, and it was a technology that doesn't exist even today. Spring 1989, Bob Lazar meets with George Knapp, a reporter for Las Vegas TV station KLAS. Lazar claims to have secrets he can no longer hold. This was really taking a toll on me. I mean, I was exhausted. He tells Knapp that he was hired by the federal government to work on an alien spacecraft at Area 51. Great. It probably would have gone to about six. And he insists that the authorities will do anything to stop him from revealing what he knows. There was a guy in the car with a gun. He shot at me and went off, and I just thought it was some government guy trying to wipe me out. Lazar tells the reporter he wants to protect himself from reprisals by going public with his amazing story. Nevertheless, he appears in silhouette to conceal his identity. So what you're saying is that we can produce... The first interview was really just to state what had happened, what was going on, and in case I suddenly disappeared, all it would do was prove that what I was saying was true. A very short amount of time, and I guarantee you, gentlemen, that... Lazar's story begins in 1988, when, he says, his background in physics and electronics lands him a job interview with top government contractor Edgerton, Germershausen and Greer, or EG&G. I was told there was an opening available from a, for a new exotic field propulsion system that I would be working in a remote area. It all sounded great to me. It's exactly what I wanted to get into. In December 1988, he is hired. On his first day of work, Lazar claims to have met a man named Dennis Mariani at the EG&G Special Projects Office at McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas. 
Dennis Mariani is kind of a military looking guy. It always looks you in the eye and very hard looking. I don't think the guy ever smiled. Mariani escorts Lazar aboard a private plane that flies them 100 miles north to an isolated military base in the Nevada desert, Area 51. Immediately after landing, Mariani subjects Lazar to a rigorous security briefing and has him sign a secrecy agreement. You basically signed away a lot of your rights. I believe it was called the 1010 agreement. It was a $10,000 fine, 10 year prison sentence, you know, for divulging any of the information presented to you. According to Lazar, he agrees to conditions he will later regret. He even gives up his right to a trial if he ever reveals anything about working at Area 51. After Lazar signs the document, he and Mariani board a bus with blacked out windows. The bus leaves Area 51 and drives, I'm guessing, 10 to 15 miles south on a dirt road. It was kind of exciting because I thought, boy, if it's we're leaving Area 51 in a bus with windows that I can't look out of. This must be really secret, and so I was fascinated. The bus finally stops at an installation called S4. Mariani explains that the site is a series of hidden hangars built into the landscape. It's extremely well camouflaged. Years later, Lazar will have a graphic artist create detailed renderings based on his own drawings of what he claims he saw at S4. There are hangar doors that are sand textured and standing back maybe three or four hundred feet, you really can't see them at all. It pretty much just looks like a continuation of the mountain. Mariani leads Lazar inside the tightly guarded facility. It was very much an oppressive military atmosphere. There was always somebody there on top of you, keeping an eye on you. They were virtually robots. They had no emotions. Not to imply that they were robots, but, you know, they acted like robots. Lazar says he has issued a security badge that authorizes his clearance through the, quote, U.S. Department of Naval Intelligence. Mariani then leads him to a secure briefing room. On the desk is a stack of blue folders. Is everything you need to know to begin working on it? Until I can... Lazar is allowed to review these files, alone. Looking through some of the information, it gave direct references to a flying saucer, to an, an extraterrestrial vehicle. I pretty much discounted that and just kept going on. And I, I thought, well, boy, this must be part of some security measure. It could be a part of all some big psychological test of some sort. So I glanced through everything and um, digested what I could. When Mariani takes him back to the hangar, Lazar claims he is confronted with an incredible sight. We walked into a hangar, which was extremely large, and they had an absolute classic flying saucer in there. So like something out of a cartoon or a science fiction movie. It was sitting on its, on its belly on the ground. And I went up and raised my hand to touch the metal on the craft and immediately got disciplined for that. Lazar assumes that the vehicle is an experimental aircraft designed to resemble something from outer space. Yeah, well, it's got a flying saucer shape. This explains why so many people see flying saucers, because we're trying to make an aircraft that, that way. So still nothing really hit my mind as far as being alien or any, anything along those lines. But Lazar says he revises that assumption when his job duties are explained to him. The basic aim of what we're doing here is to see if we can duplicate any of this material with substances found on Earth. Or, well, what do you mean, with substances found on Earth? And then it began to validate some of what I had read, that this was in fact an alien craft. As he examines the saucer, Lazar becomes convinced that it is, in fact, of extraterrestrial origin. It was obviously made for something smaller, ideally about half the height 
of a human would have no problem walking around in there. Everything is a rounded, curved radius to it. It looks like the entire thing was an injection mold, like uh, made out of plastic or wax. He says he is then told that the vehicle's propulsion system allows the pilot to traverse great distances instantaneously by manipulating time and space. If you have a machine that can create gravity, that makes force fields a reality, that makes time travel possible, all the stuff you read about in science fiction becomes possible if you can manipulate gravity. Lazar is overwhelmed by the possibilities. Until now, he had considered the whole idea of flying saucers to be a fantasy. It actually left me pretty much confused and led to a lot of sleepless nights for a long time. Everything you didn't believe is true. December 1988. According to Bob Lazar, he is employed at a top-secret military installation in the Nevada desert called Area 51. The Las Vegas resident is here, he asserts, to study an alien spaceship. Lazar claims there are at least nine such craft concealed within Area 51. They were all in hangars and some were not completely assembled, but the sport model, the sleek one, the one that I was allowed in at that one time was the only one I ever had physical contact with. Lazar's main responsibility is to determine what had powered the vehicle. This was such an advanced machine that we were looking at, from the fuel to the way it was handled, to the energy to put, it puts out, there was, it, it was completely alien in, in every way. He nicknames one ship the Sport Model and claims it makes several low-altitude test flights in early 1989. Lazar says his supervisor, Dennis Mariani, invites him to observe one of them. The craft lifted off the ground silently with a slight glow on the bottom which I assumed was a corona discharge, kind of like a St. Elmo's fire from high voltage. It made just a little hissing sound, lifted off the ground and moved over to the left and to the right and sat down. And to me, that was uh, absolutely impressive. Throughout his time at Area 51, Lazar claims, his employers keep him working irregular hours. I only went out when I was called out there. Uh, I could get a call at 9 o'clock at night Actually, I got a call once at 11.30 at night, and they stated, we would like you down at McCarran Airport by 12.15. How do you tell your wife? You know, you're in bed, you get a call. Okay, I gotta go. Well, what, what is it? Oh, it's my job. I don't know if I'm gonna be coming back until tomorrow. And then, by this point, Lazar says, he had worked at Area 51 for four months and felt he could no longer abide by his confidentiality agreement. At sundown on Wednesday, March 22nd, 1989, Lazar, his wife, and three friends drive to the edge of Area 51 to watch the test flight of a saucer. The craft was typically only tested on a Wednesday night because it was the middle of the week, because there was very little travel on the adjacent highways to the test site. Around 8 p.m., the group notices a bright light rising behind a mountain pass in the distance. It came towards us very fast and made abrupt 90-degree turns. Sure, sure, okay. Yeah, we're fine. And the higher energy level the craft is at, the more it glows. Oh, my God. Lazar's friends are awestruck by the object's erratic maneuvers. Nothing can, can make a 90-degree turn moving at hundreds of miles an hour. And that's what left an impression in everyone's mind. According to Lazar, the alien ship hovers for a few more moments before it disappears behind the mountains. The following Wednesday night, Lazar and his group return to the same spot in the desert. Since we got away with it the first time, we wanted to go back and now actually get pictures of the craft. But 
you know, it's like filming a star at night. It's just a blob of light moving around. One week later, they make a third nighttime foray to Area 51. Oh, wow. This time, however, they've pushed their luck too far. The security guys had found us, and it's pitch black out there. And they turn the lights on, and there's, there's just an army of people out there. It, it, it was quite incredible. The armed guards check their IDs and take their names before releasing them. As they leave, Lazar and his friends are pulled over by a Lincoln County Sheriff's deputy who holds them for questioning. The next day, Lazar asserts, Dennis Mariani and Area 51 security agents threaten him. One of the first things they said was, you know, when we trusted you with this information, we didn't mean, you know, intend for you to tell everyone you know about it. <laughs> they Gardell's an M16 directly in my face and, uh, you know, wanted to impress upon me how serious they were about it. According to Lazar, he is released and his employment at Area 51 ends. From then on, he says, he becomes the victim of a relentless campaign of intimidation. I was driving down Charleston Boulevard in Las Vegas, and as I came to the freeway on-ramp, there was a car that kept trying to get alongside of me. I heard a gunshot, and it caught my attention, and there was a guy in the car with a gun. I went straight, went off the end, and stopped in the dirt. I was really just paralyzed in the car. I was holding the steering wheel, and I thought he was coming up alongside of me, and there was just nothing I can do. It is at this point that Lazar decides to take his story to the public in an interview with KLAS TV reporter George Knapp. In May of 1989, he appears in silhouette on the 5 o'clock local news. I did go on the air and basically say some of the stuff that I had seen. Right after the interview, I get a call from Dennis Mariani at home, and he said, do you have any idea what we're going to do to you now? And I said, no, what? And he hung up the phone. Yes. Six months later, Lazar agrees to another interview with KLAS-TV. This time, he reveals his identity on the air. Afterwards, he appears on numerous other television and radio shows, and even creates a video about his experiences. I had at least partial views of the nine different discs out at S4. But I went into much greater detail. Years ago, I thought I'd never hear myself say this, but that vehicle... Explained what was going on, who I worked with, where the things were. You know, just pretty much got it all on the record. They led me to believe it was uh, a field... The TV reports system. that he did brought a lot of attention to the area and to him. In secret that we were working They were picked up nationally by other media, uh, and they helped establish the whole mythology of Area 51 in the national consciousness. Soon, people from across the country flocked to the Nevada desert, hoping to glimpse the mysterious lights of an alien spacecraft. I watched a craft with my niece one night for 20 minutes do really, really strange maneuvers. I know there's strange activity that goes on out here. It was actually the second time when I saw the craft, when I got to enter it. In November 1989, Bob Lazar makes an astonishing claim on a Las Vegas television news program. He says that he worked on alien spacecraft at a super-secret military base called Area 51. Lazar is not the first to describe extraordinary events at a facility the government denies even exists. Rumors about UFO sightings in the Nevada desert had been heard for decades. But Lazar is the first to maintain that he had actually worked on alien technology. He seems to have little reason to lie. I don't know anything about aliens or abductions or crop circles or any of that, but I do know this craft came from somewhere else. Lazar looked like he could have been what he said, which was a sort of nerdy engineer who worked for government high-tech research programs. 
the uh, materials that were in use completely alien to us. Pardon the and he and, seems uh, to be radiating this sense of conviction. Some autopsy report. Almost all UFO uh, stories can usually tell in about five seconds that the person is nuts. Where you get the power what was uh, interesting in Lazar, really it was a compellingly well-told story. In the world of UFO fans, Lazar becomes an overnight sensation. Bob's coming out, so to speak. Just lit a fire under every UFO nut and enthusiast in the world. I mean, there were busloads of people coming in there. At the edge of Area 51, the town of Rachel, Nevada, becomes the jumping off spot for the curious. Rachel is an obscure little community in the middle of absolute nowhere really became the center of the universe for people interested in, in Area 51 and in UFOs. Everybody in the country and the world right now knows about what's going on out here. Oh, yeah. UFO buffs are not the only ones who make pilgrimages to watch the desert skies. <laughs> Aviation enthusiasts, including a group of amateur plane spotters called the Interceptors, are also intrigued by Lazar's story. Jim Goodall is a senior member of the Interceptors and, since 1987, a regular sky watcher at Area 51. My obsession has been classified aircraft programs. It's that first glimpse of something you've never seen or the public has never seen. That's what's exciting about going out here in the desert. And you want to be the first person to, you know, to get a high-quality image. While some attribute the mysterious lights in the sky to extraterrestrial visitors, a bright object is being spotted right there. The interceptors maintain that Area 51 is really a top secret testing facility for U.S. military aircraft. They point to hard facts and photographic evidence to make their case. This particular disk appeared to be in excellent condition. And Even so, some of them, including Goodall, find Bob Lazar's story credible. I'm a technology person. I'm a hardware person. I'm not a UFO nut. I believe Bob Lazar because Bob Lazar you know, told a believable story and has never altered it. Goodall is persuaded in part by what appears to be solid evidence that Lazar did work for the military. A yearly earning statement from 1988 to 1989. According to Lazar, his W-2 tax form was issued by the, quote, Department of Naval Intelligence. There is, however, no such known Department of Government. In 1990, during Operation Desert Shield, Goodall is on active duty in Washington, D.C. with the Minnesota Air National Guard. He decides to check on the validity of Lazar's W-2 form and goes to the Navy's investigative office in the Pentagon. I went in to the Department of Naval Investigation in the Pentagon. And I said, I'd like a verification of where this location is. It's a classified zip code. And the Navy officer said, just a minute. And made a phone call. He said, you know, the Admiral would like to see you. Close the door, Sergeant. So I go into this Admiral's office. And he said, Sergeant, if you ever come in this office again with something like this, I'll have you court-martialed. Now get out of my office and get out of there now. If his W-2 was phony, why did this admiral have a hissy fit over it? Lazar's supporters claim that the so-called Department of Naval Intelligence, in keeping with the secrecy of Area 51, is a covert organization. As such, its existence has been kept from the general public and even the U.S. Congress. But despite the support of people like Jim Goodall, critics believe that Bob Lazar is perpetrating a hoax. In particular, they cite the absence of any evidence to corroborate his story. He talks about what kind of UFOs he saw inside and so forth. He, you know, how can you react to that? I just try to think about, for what he tells us that, that we can verify, I just haven't found anything. Skeptics scrutinize other claims made by Lazar. He worked there for less than 40 hours. And this is according to his own statements. In this one work week, he found the fuel that propels these aircraft or these uh, flying saucers. Now that's a pretty amazing a discovery for your first work week. Stanton Friedman, a physicist educated at the University of Chicago, 
checks into Lazar's educational background. He supposedly had a master's in physics from MIT and another one in electronics from Caltech. Okay, I check MIT, they never heard of him. I checked Caltech, they never heard of him. I checked his high school. Turned out he graduated in the bottom third of his high school class. Moreover, government contractor EG&G, with whom Lazar claims to have interviewed for the Area 51 job, says it has no record of Bob Lazar at all. So, right away you have a problem with a guy who has a, a background that doesn't match up to uh, what he claims and can't demonstrate that he worked where he says he worked. So, while you may not reject his claims out of hand, you've got to look at them with more suspicion. The electrical energy is... Transmitted without wires and I... He's a clever guy, he sounds very good, he comes across very well. People want to believe him. He's a con man. Yes, I was... Uh... While some dismiss Bob Lazar as a fraud, others believe there is a more sinister motive to his behavior. That he is an agent of the government, tasked with perpetuating disinformation about Area 51. One had to question whether... Lazar was sure who he was. Perhaps he was serving as a disinformation agent unwillingly. There were those who believed that he had been in some way brainwashed or even drugged. But for Lazar's supporters, the U.S. government's silence speaks volumes. If he hadn't been involved with these people, they could say hey, he's a phony. That it ended Bob Lazar's career as a spokesperson for UFOs and reverse engineering and propulsion systems. No one ever did that. Some conspiracy buffs believe that the U.S. government actually encouraged Lazar's story and the myth of UFO sightings. It's an attempt, they say, to distract the public from what was really happening inside Area 51. There seemed to be a good strength to the theory that they were generating a lot of noise to disguise the real signal, which was experiments with advanced aircraft and that Lazar was the most intense piece of noise they were delivering. Generally referred to as a flying saucer. In the early 1990s, after Bob Lazar goes public with his sensational claim that there are alien spacecraft inside Area 51, the isolated high security base becomes a magnet for tourists. There were bus tours going out there, so it, um, that pretty much did it. That put it on the map. Security is intensified to keep the curious out. But some say that the government actually uses Lazar's story to its advantage. In that case, if somebody actually saw a test flight and saw something they weren't supposed to see and they talk about it, they are just dealt with by the public as another UFO nut who has seen a UFO flying. Even though eyewitness reports and photographs of Area 51 are widely circulated on the Internet, government officials continue to deny that the base even exists. It'd be like going out and having a Goodyear blimp out in the parking lot and, and someone tell you, there's no blimp out there. You know darn well there's one. Until someone official says, yes, this is Area 51, it doesn't exist. And that's our government. In 1995, the installation's borders are greatly expanded, effectively prohibiting outsiders from even seeing the base. Any sign that, that says that we will shoot you if you trespass into here, well, why is that? What's the reason for it? I'm an American taxpayer. That's my stuff they're flying out there. I help pay for it. It's we the people, it's not us the government. That's been my philosophy from the very beginning. If you're flying it over public land, I have every right to photograph and see it. You can't blame the government for wanting to conceal what's going on there, but you can't blame the public for wondering what's going on there. There are some who say they know exactly what's been happening at Area 51. Men who worked there and can prove it. They saw much that the government didn't want the public to know about, but none of it, they say, was from outer space. Supposedly, uh, 
you know, extraterrestrial somethings that happened over there. I know nothing about that. I just read about it. it. Certainly didn't have any of that there when I was there. I was all over that base. Frank Murray flew the top secret A-12 spy plane at Area 51. He says the base played a vital role in U.S. military research and development during the Cold War. The base really got started in about 54 when Lockheed needed a place to test and develop the U-2 airplane, the first spy plane. In the early 1960s, the A-12 was developed to replace the U-2. The CIA commissioned this supersonic reconnaissance jet, capable of reaching speeds in excess of Mach 3 and cruising at altitudes over 90,000 feet. Frank Murray and others tested the A-12 at Area 51. We flew all over the United States with the airplane. Nobody knew we were there. We didn't tell anybody. There was no need to. Murray and former radar operator T.D. Barnes can talk about their experiences now because the top secret projects were declassified in the 1990s. Barnes does acknowledge that he had limited access to the base. There was something going on that we did not have a need to know. They hurt everybody on the base into the mess hall and pulled the blackout curtains. They have guards on them and, and would stay in there two or three hours or whatever the time period was required for whatever they were doing outdoors to wrap up. For the men assigned to Area 51, the intense secrecy permeated every aspect of their professional lives and even extended to their own families. Tell them nothing. Tell them just on a classified project, can't talk about it. And they never did know until the whole thing was over. Both Murray and Barnes say they saw no alien spacecraft during their time at Area 51. But they did observe their colleagues serving their country in a program so secret, most Americans never knew of their heroism. We lost a lot of pilots. And I do not recall ever hearing a test pilot panic. As they hit the ground, they were still giving us scientific data. They're so trained. After Barnes and Murray left, other servicemen tested newer technology, like the F-117 stealth bomber in the late 1970s. Some say this plane could have been the real source of many UFO sightings at Area 51. The first time you see an F-117 head-on, it looks like a flying saucer. If F-117 flight tests sparked rumors of alien spacecraft over the Nevada desert, that may have been just fine with military authorities. Why give it away by saying, oh, there's another military test going on in the high-altitude aircraft? Much better oh, yeah. to dismiss it all as just being so much UFO nonsense. What military scientists have been developing at Area 51 in the years since the F-117 is anyone's guess. In the tense post-9-11 era, Area 51 is as impenetrable as ever. But it is evident that the base is still very active. Gotta be. The runway is now 25,000 feet long, and it's two or three times bigger than when I was there. For all I know, they're building systems to prevent an invasion of alien beings. You don't know. The technology doesn't sit still. So what are they up to? Jim Goodall says he once posed that very question to Ben Rich, a now deceased former vice president of the Lockheed Corporation. He said, Jim, we have things out in the desert that are 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. If you've seen it on Star Trek or Star Wars or whatever science fiction movie you've seen, we've been there, done that. I said, can you expand upon that? He said, nope. Despite efforts to keep a tight lid on the activities at Area 51, officials are forced to publicly acknowledge the existence of the base for the first time when a lawsuit is filed in 1994 against the government. Allegations that hazardous chemicals had been improperly burned at the site leads critics to charge that the veil of secrecy 
is endangering the public safety. The whole existence of a toxic waste dump in, in Area 51 is a perfect metaphor for the toxicity of excessive secrecy and the dangers of secrecy. And secrecy, like any powerful chemical, is very useful stuff and it's also very dangerous stuff. Until 1994, the U.S. government refused to acknowledge the existence of its super-secret base known as Area 51. But in August of that year, a lawsuit brought by former employees of the secret airbase forces the Department of Defense to change this policy. The suit claims that workers had been ordered to burn toxic byproducts of the stealth fighter program in open pits at the base causing them serious illnesses, and in some cases, death. When they went to court, the government used every measure at its disposal to shut